All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is Chris Callahan speaking. I'm with University of Vermont Extension, uh, where my focus is agricultural engineering. I'm also the project director for the Northeast Center to Advance Food Safety, which is one of four uh, regional centers funded uh, jointly by the FDA and the USDA to support training, education, and outreach related to the Food Safety Modernization Act. And I'm joined today by uh, Betsy Bin at Cornell University. Betsy, are you able to unmute yourself and do a quick introduction? Yep. Uh, my name is Betsy Bin. I'm the director of the Produce Safety Alliance and the executive director of the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell University. Um, I primarily work on produce safety, uh, working with growers to implement good agricultural practices, and now that FISMA is around, helping them understand um, expectations associated with the produce safety rule. Great, thank you. Um, so Betsy and I are uh, jointly working as part of a much larger project, which is a uh, USDA funded specialty crops research initiative project um, focused on Eastern broccoli, uh, broccoli in the Eastern part of the country. And it's uh, led by Thomas Bjorkman at Cornell as well. So the point is this is part of a larger project that uh, is looking at all sorts of uh, the factors involved in making broccoli a uh, a, a a greater part of the um the growing volume in in the eastern part of the country um there's breeding trials uh breeding work going on there's variety trials agronomic trials um and one section of that work is related to uh the produce safety aspects of growing broccoli and betsy and i are working on that that part of the project and so the um the idea of this webinar is to have a, a bit of a conversation about uh, produce safety as it relates specifically to broccoli as a, a single crop. Um, and so with that, the goals for the today, the overview of the webinar, uh, we're going to provide a, a general overview of produce safety, um, focus both on good agricultural practices or GAPS, as well as uh, the F Food Safety Modernization Act, also known as FISMA, and a specific rule within that act that came out of that act called the Produce Safety Rule, or PSR. So getting some alphabet soup out of the way right off the bat there. I'm going to talk about produce safety as it relates specifically to broccoli um, and then provide a little bit of an overview of what our plans are with respect to pro project outputs and resources, including guide sheets and uh, fact sheets. And we'd like to get some input from the attendees today on those plans and uh, just make sure we're on track and to see uh, if there's anything that we've missed that might be particularly helpful to you all. As we go along, there will be a couple of opportunities for engagement and specifically how we're going to handle that is with the chat box. And so there should be on your Zoom interface, there should be a um, an icon that looks like a cartoon balloon with three dots in it. Or you might otherwise see the chat box open. I've already put some information in there, specifically our contact information for Betsy and I. So you might want to make sure that's open and uh, you can type a message in the bottom of that chat box at any time during the presentation, but there will be a couple of specific times when we ask uh, specific questions and we'll be looking for feedback from you and that'd be the place to do it. The other thing we'll be doing is a couple of polls where uh, you'll be presented with a question on your screen and you'll be asked to uh, respond to that poll. So again, we, we appreciate your feedback as we go through this. So one of the things that Betsy and I wanted to start with was, uh, and this will be your, your first in chance to use the chat box is just sort of get a feel from the folks attending why produce safety matters to you. And uh, in other words, why, um, why are you here today? So take a moment and put some thoughts into the chat box. Uh, we have one attendee who is an extension educator interested in passing along food safety information to growers. Um, we have another attendee who is GAP certified concerned with customer safety, food safety, would like to get wholesale quality. Would like to get to wholesale quality. Part of that is FISMA. Great. Good motivations. Thank you. And I'll just give another second here for somebody who might be typing. Currently working on post-harvest broccoli study at the University of Tennessee with a with my major professor. Thanks. That's great. Good. So we have a wide, a fairly wide variety of folks attending today. Uh, we have growers, we have extension educators, and we have uh, people working uh, on their on their graduate work. So that's great. Thank you. Betsy, you want to take over? I would love to take over, Chris. Thanks. 
So Chris was mentioning the Food Safety Modernization Act. This was signed into law in 2011, and it has several different rules associated with it. Um, the produce safety rule is highlighted here because that's really going to be the focus of, um, of today. And I do want to, especially for this group, if anybody is doing any sort of processing, um, doing any cutting, processing, um, you would then also be subject to the human foods rule. So I just wanted to mention that, but today we're really gonna focus on the produce safety rule. One of the questions we get asked all the time, and I think it's important to mention for this webinar, this webinar was really created um, to give you guys a big overview related to the produce safety rule. And as Chris said, to figure out what we need to do in association with this broccoli project, to um, provide additional information to you. So one of the things that's asked oftentimes by growers is, you know, am I subject to this rule? Um, the produce safety rule has provisions for people to be not covered by the rule. So if you grow and sell under $25,000 of fresh produce, you are not covered by the rule. But if your farm um, grows, harvests, or packs produce, um, that is over that $25,000 mark, you are likely subject to part of the rule. In addition to being subject to the part of the rule, you can also be what we call qualified exempt. So this um, decision tree here that was created by the FDA, it's available online if you wanna download it. It will help you work through the questions to see if you are subject to the rule. You know, so it asks the question of, do you farm, uh, do you grow, harvest, or pack whole produce? Yes. Then it asks the question of, do you, are your average sales over three years, $25,000 or, or less? If you say yes, you can see there it says in red, your farm is not covered by this rule. If, your produ if you produce one of the commodities that FDA has identified as rarely consume raw, there is a comprehensive list in the rule of things that they consider not eaten raw. Broccoli is not one of them, but if you were to grow potatoes or something that would be um, not consumed raw, then, you, um, then the product you grow is not covered by the rule. The reason I bring this up is because I'm assuming most of the folks on this call grow broccoli, but you may in fact grow other commodities. So when determining um, if you are qualified exempt, you have to include all of the food you grow. So your broccoli plus any other produce items, if you do any value added on your farm, if you rotate into a crop that's sold to animal feed, that would be considered food. So if you look down in that lighter blue box where they're talking about um, average food sales in three years, if it's above $500,000, you are in the rule. Thank you, Chris. But if you are below $500,000 and the majority of your food um, goes directly to a qualified end user, you could be qualified exempt. And I agree, I skipped over the light gray and the darker gray and the darker blue. And those are related to um, uh, food you use for your personal use, what I like to call the gardener's exemption, and if you send it to commercial processing. So if you send it to be canned, um, then you could, that's a kill step. So that's a pretty big, quick overview. We're not gonna linger on it, but I think there's a question coming up that we uh, would like to ask you because if this is something you need more information on, we certainly would be happy to provide it. So do you know if you're covered by the FSMA produce safety rule? Um, that's a question we'd like you to respond in the chat box um, and let us know. So, folks, uh, any any growers on the line who know whether they're whether or not they are covered uh, by the produce safety rule, we'd love to to hear if that's um, something that's perfectly clear um, to you, or if it's something that you might be able to use a little bit of specific guidance on. So, we have somebody who's noted that uh, they they sell feed grains, um, but ninety percent or so of their veg is donated. And so, yeah, that's a that's a good point because there is a the, the specific um, inclusion clause of coverage that relates to all um, all food sales. Uh, that's you want to talk about how feed sales ties into that a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, so it, it comes back to what I was saying. The first question you want to ask yourself is, do you sell over $25,000 of fresh produce or not a year? So that's sort of the baseline question you want to ask yourself. If you do a lot of animal feed and you have a roadside stand and you bring in $10,000 of produce, then we don't worry about food sales. Start with that produce. Do you sell over $25,000 of produce? And if the answer is yes, then, then you have to start considering the other questions about feed. So if you sell over $25,000 of produce, then you have to start adding in all of your food sales, which would be those animal feed sales. And if those are under $500,000, then you ask yourself the question of qualified end user. If it's over $500,000, then, then you're subject to the rule. Unless those commodities are um, not likely to be eaten raw or you fit one of those other caveats. Great, so we didn't have a whole lot of response on the last question, so I guess what the follow-up is, would, would there be, uh, would a webinar focused on FISMA produce safety rule coverage specifically be helpful, even just a short sort of walk through? Yeah, such as exclusions, exemptions, covered crops, not covered crops, <laughs> any yep. of that kind of stuff. So anybody who thinks that would be helpful, please just make a quick note in the chat box. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good. Okay. Please feel free to continue providing some feedback on that, and uh, we're going to keep moving along if that's all right. So uh, one of the other questions we get asked a lot is about compliance. So with what short overview I just gave you, um, in terms of compliance dates for the rule, uh, we start with, it, it's a staggered implementation. Um, businesses that sell over $500,000 of produce, now again, the implementation goes back to produce, I know that's a little confusing, but if you sell over $500,000 of produce, you, your first compliance date was, um, was this year. 12618, it's that second column there. Um, and what I want to, which we'll mention later, but the water related compliance dates, we get a lot of questions about water. Right now, those are proposed to be delayed by four years. So that would give you an additional four years to begin your water sa sampling protocols to meet the requirements. Um, that is proposed, but uh, I think everybody's hoping that that will be adopted so you'll have an additional four years. And then um, businesses that two fifty to five hundred dollars, five hundred thousand dollar range, uh, your implementation date is next year, January twenty eighth of twenty nineteen. Very small businesses, that's that twenty five to two fifty thousand dollar range, will be the year after that. So um, one twenty seven twenty, I think it's one twenty eight to oh one twenty seven twenty. Um, again, those water compliance dates stretch out an additional four years, okay? So 22 for the biggest farms, 2023 for the next size, and 2024. Um, you'll notice the red circled box on the far right on this graph, date of retention of records supporting a qualified exemption. Because the first implementation dates for the big farms happen this year, next year um, you should keep your records now. And if you haven't started now, start now for that three years to prove that you meet the monetary requirements for that qualified exemption. I was tasked with kicking us off talking about good agricultural practices in the Produce Safety Alliance curriculum. A lot of growers are familiar with <laughs> good agricultural practices since they've been implementing them um, since about 1999 is when good ag practices training happened. Several growers are getting third-party audits. I know a grower on the chat box already said they get audits. For those of you that are not aware, good agricultural practices or any procedure activity that reduces microbial risk to fruits and vegetables on the farm or in the packing house. So that means management decisions. That means the implementation of practices such as testing your water. Um, so that's been happening since 1999. When the, Pro the Food Safety Modernization Act's Produce Safety Rule showed up and the Produce Safety Alliance was tasked with creating a curriculum we felt we really needed to combine good agricultural practices as a foundation so growers would understand, okay, here's things you may already be doing, here's things you may have heard. Now here's what the regulation 
says about it. Here's the requirements that govern it. So it does really combine both the Food Safety Modernization Act's produce safety rule requirements as well as good agricultural practices. And according to the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, Section 112.22c, at least one supervisor from the farm or a responsible party must complete food safety training at least equivalent to the standardized curriculum. Um, and that PSA curriculum meets that requirement. So the Produce Safety Alliance training meets the requirements of 122C. So what are the areas that are covered in both GAPS and um, FISMA? And they're the, the things you guys are all used to, the worker training programs, water in the rule, all water is called agricultural water. If it touches the harvestable portion of the crop, it's agricultural water. There are different requirements for water used during production versus that used at or after harvest, but it includes all that monitoring, testing, treatment. Also manure and compost management or what we wanna call soil amendment applications. Discussions of wildlife and animal um, monitoring or intrusion on a farm and then sanitation programs, which Chris is gonna talk about today. So starting off with workers, it's always good when you think about food safety, when you think about good agricultural practices, it's always good to start with a risk assessment. And I like this slide because it, it shows you how to do that. When you're thinking about workers, why are we concerned about workers? Well, we're concerned that they could carry human pathogens as we all can. Things like Shigella, hepatitis A, norovirus, these things come from people. And produce is hand harvested, as you can see in these pictures um, to the right. We do a lot of hand harvesting of produce. Certainly, broccoli is hand harvested. Um, and we pack it. And if we do not have good hygiene practices, if we don't wash our hands after going to the bathroom, we can spread disease and fecal material, thus the fecal oral route. Um, you know, someone's fecal material going in somebody else's mouth um, at ingestion of the produce. So these are, are concerns we have. And so how do we reduce those risks? We train people, we ask people to wash their hands, we discuss how to handle illnesses and injuries. And so that's just a quick walkthrough of what a risk assessment would look like in the sense of workers. How do I assess the risks posed by workers? And then when you turn to the rule, so that's a basic assessment of risk. When you look at the rule, the rule requires that workers get training on principles of food hygiene and food safety. It also requires that training cover how to recognize symptoms of foodborne illness, vomiting, diarrhea, things that should be an indication that you are sick. There's other requirements that um, workers get training that's relevant to their job. Um, so encompassing all of that stuff that workers do on your farm. There's a requirement that farms provide resources so that they can follow good agricultural practices, such as toilet paper, soap, water, paper towels, a way to dry your hands in a sanitary manner. These are all things that you should be doing, whether it's required by the rule or not. The rule then also has specific requirements for workers. They have to maintain personal cleanliness. They have to remove or cover hand jewelry that cannot be cleaned. They shouldn't eat, chew gum, or use tobacco in an area used for a covered activity. Well, what's a covered activity? It's anything that's in the handling or packing of a covered commodity, something that's likely to be eaten raw. They also stipulate that uh, workers should never harvest covered produce contaminated with feces and that they should never harvest or distribute dropped covered produce. And that's kind of a new one um, for a lot of folks. Moving quickly, again, this is an overview kind of talk, so that's the worker part. Moving on to agricultural water risks during production, keeping in mind I mentioned that agricultural water during production is different than that used at or after harvest. There's really three things everybody should consider when thinking about evaluating your risks. What is the source of your water? The source of your water is a public water supply or a groundwater source that you know is high quality, not likely to be contaminated or under the influence of surface water, then that's a good source of water. Then really where your concern would be in your distribution system. So if it's good quality water to start, how you apply it maybe isn't as important as knowing that the system is, is clean. 
again, there's a, you'll note here in bold, there is a proposed delay to testing requirements outlined in FSMA. So I just wanna reiterate that. Next comes the application method. If water does not touch the harvestable portion of the crop, it's not considered ag water in the rule. And it also reduces the risk posed by water. So really, if the application method doesn't touch the harvestable portion of the crop, it's not ag water, but it also is a symbol of it being lower risk because you're not likely to transfer stuff from the water to the crop. And lastly is the timing of your application. If you apply water and leave it in the field under the sun, you're likely to get microbial die-off because of solarization, desiccation, the drying that happens in the field. So if you have a water source that's of questionable quality and you apply it overhead, which would be sort of the highest risk because it's touching the harvestable portion, then if you can apply the water at planting or farther away from harvest, you're gonna reduce those risks. The absolute highest risk here would be a surface water source applied overhead right next to harvest. And that would be your highest risk scenario. When we look at these FDA water compliance data extension that I've now mentioned, this is the third time, growers often ask, what do I do in the meantime? And what we like to tell them is if you're testing your water to meet buyer audit requirements, keep testing the water. Develop those management strategies to identify and reduce risks, looking at a survey of your water source, trying to keep it clean. If you've never tested your water, you should start testing your water. And I give the um, generic E. coli levels that are outlined in the rule here, the 126 or less colony forming units per 100 mils of water, geometric mean, or the 410 or less colony forming units per 100 mils of water, statistical threshold value. There are calculators online, uh, we can post those in the chat box when I'm done, that you can use to plug this in to see how you would fit if you were trying to comply with the rule now. But I put them here for people that may never have tested, just to give yourself a benchmark of where those water test results should fall and how you should feel about it. If you've never tested, test before you start using the water, and test again during frequent use periods because that will change the, the source of the water, especially if it's a pond and it lowers the volume that's in that pond. Um, also, I would like to encourage everybody to inspect your water distribution system. This is a requirement in 112.42 of the rule, but it's a good thing to start mapping your distribution system and checking it at least annually. Moving on to soil amendments. If you look at the FSMA produce safety rule concepts for soil amendments, there's a couple of different divisions that I want to point out. There's this term called biological soil amendments of animal origin. And what that means is any soil amendment that comes from an animal source. Think about manures, think about blood meals, bone meals, anything that comes out of an animal versus vegetative origin materials, such as pre-consumer vegetative waste. That's vegetative waste that would come out of, say, a kitchen before any consumer has eaten it. It's all vegetative pre-consumer, so it's not contaminated. So think about the division of where do your soil amendments fit in this? Are they biological or are they vegetative or chemical in origin? And then you wanna ask yourself if it's a biological um, soil amendment of animal origin, is it treated or untreated? So are you using a validated composting process to treatment? Is it a chicken pellet that's been through a pasteurization process? That's the next kind of delineation you wanna ask yourself. Currently in the rule, the application to harvest interval for raw manure is reserved because FDA is looking for more input from the industry. So if you're using raw manure, right now FDA has said if you wanna follow the National Organic Program standards that 120 days prior to harvest, that's a prudent thing to do until they have more application to harvest interval information. So these are just some basic things to ask yourself if you're using soil amendments. Again, what type of soil amendment am I using? Is it raw manure? Is it composted manure? Is it a chemical? What crops receive the soil amendment? A lot of growers do rotation. Putting that manure or high risk fertilizer on an agronomic crop instead of in the produce year that you grow it. Um, when you apply it, that day to harvest interval, the time of the year, again, applying manures when the ground is frozen is just gonna cause runoff into our streams, which is bad. And then how do you apply it? Incorporated, injected, surface applied, those things will help you assess your risks. 
And then of course, how often and where do you apply it? Um, there've been a lot of studies done that, you know, the field closest to the barn with animals gets the most manure applications because it's easy to get out there and spread it. But that's not always good when we talk about one field getting excessive applications that can lead to environmental impacts. Moving on to monitoring wildlife activity, there is a real uh, move towards understanding that wildlife can pose a risk to produce, both from direct deposition of feces in the field, but also moving feces around when they're in there, when there's an um, evidence of intrusion. So really what you wanna look at is, have the animals been in there? Is it likely that anything's contaminated? Trying to keep track of which fields have the pressure. I will say that this is an area that is very frustrating growers most of the time from a rural perspective because most growers are trying to already control wildlife because wildlife eat crops, they destroy crops if they're rooting around in there. So most farms already have a wildlife management plan or process because they can be so destructive. Um, in terms of the rule, you noted earlier that workers are told not to harvest produce um, with fecal material on it. So it's really trying to get at that point of getting out there prior to harvest, making sure the field hasn't had significant intrusion, and if it has, how do you minimize the risks associated with that? Whether it's instructing the workers just not to pick an area, or whether it um, is flagging an area, making a zone where you're not gonna harvest around where that intrusion happened. So one of my last slides is talking about agricultural water at and after harvest. Again, this is kind of that post-harvest water we're talking about. For this, the rule stipulates that it can have no detectable generic E. coli per 100 mil sample. So that's any water that directly contacts covered produce during or after harvest. This also includes water that contacts food contact surfaces, which Chris is gonna talk about sanitation here in a minute. Um, water used to make ice, water used for hand washing, um, even if you have an untreated surface water source that does not have no detectable E. coli, you cannot use it. So you cannot use an untreated surface water source, even if you take a test and it says there's no detectable E. coli, you still can't use it unless it's treated because that surface water quality can change quite quickly. There's also a requirement that you maintain water quality throughout use. You can do this a couple of different ways. You can add a sanitizer to prevent cross-contamination from a contaminated produce to the water that can then contaminate other produce. Or, I guess you should say, and the rule does require that you establish a water change schedule and visually monitor buildup of organic material. I know some people have concerns about using sanitizers. One way, if you don't want to use a sanitizer, is to just change that water more frequently to make sure you're not at risk of cross-contamination. I think that's the end of your show, that's, Betsy. That is the end of my show. And yeah. I turn it over to my um, colleague, Chris Callahan. <laughs> so I'm going to pick up where Betsy left off. Um, and uh, one thing to note here is the uh, this webinar has been based largely on the, uh, the curriculum developed by the Produce Safety Alliance, which Betsy leads. Um, and it's just an incredible resource for us to have to build um, sort of purpose-built uh, webinars and other workshops around. One thing to note is that the, the full Produce Safety Alliance grower training is a, it's a day-long um, course. Uh, this is not intended to uh, replace that. Uh, and there is also a uh, a train the trainer um, specific workshop that uh, or course that that adds on to that. So again, we're we're focusing this on things that are particularly helpful, hopefully, to those working in broccoli as a specific crop. But there is this larger curriculum to to bear in mind, and it's delivered over the over the course of uh, one day for growers and uh, one day plus one day for uh, lead trainers or uh, trainers in general. Okay, picking up where Betsy left off, I want to highlight the, the specific terms that we've been using and will continue to use here, cleaning and sanitizing, um, and in particular note that they're two uh, very different things, uh, although uh, quite related. Uh, cleaning is the actual removal of dirt um, and other debris from surfaces, and that can include 
both anything from brushing, you know, sort of mechanically removing it with a brush to, uh, uh, or rinsing, but it can also uh, mean using clean water and a detergent, a detergent being something we use to uh, specifically dislodge and chemically uh, free uh, dirt and debris. And there are different detergents depending on what is uh, being cleaned and what's being removed. Sanitizing, on the other hand, is treating that surface that you've just cleaned to reduce or eliminate microorganisms. And specifically, we're after uh, human pathogens in this case. And one of the things to keep in mind here is we can't just sanitize a surface without cleaning it. You can't sanitize a dirty surface. We have to clean first. And so... This is a nice set of graphics that the Produce Safety Alliance has developed that summarizes the four critical steps in cleaning and sanitizing. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, step one, we wanna remove any of the obvious dirt and debris from the food contact surface area. Step two, clean with a detergent, scrub the surface. So we're looking to both use mechanical and chemical means to, to clean, the, um, clean the surface. Step three, we wanna rinse that surface with clean water, uh, making sure we remove the detergent and the soil. And then lastly, we're gonna apply a sanitizer. And sanitizer also, uh, sanitizers are also known as antimicrobial solutions. Um, and again, we wanna make sure that we're using something that is labeled for that use, and we wanna use it according to the label. Um, essentially, these uh, we wanna follow the same practices we would for a pesticide, for example, or an herbicide. Um, they are labeled for specific uses and they're labeled um, with respect to how to use them. And so some sanitizers might require a dwell period or require a rinse with water after use and others may not. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of all this, another very important step is letting the surface air dry. And so if we think about broccoli, uh, post-harvest broccoli handling lines, for example, it, it's an, an important thing to remember that when we're done cleaning and sanitizing, doing something to make sure that those surfaces can actually dry. Um, and that might mean having a, a, a fan to promote airflow through a, um, a cooling line, for example, or an ice line. Um, and it might mean uh, making sure that air is circulated and ventilated within the space so that we have fresh air coming in. Um, to help dry those surfaces. Icing is something that's used uh, quite regularly in uh, specifically in bro broccoli, either top icing or using an ice slurry to fill um, stacked pallets. Um, and so I wanted to focus specifically on this a little bit. And the reason this might be something we're thinking about is ice is considered post-harvest water. And as Betsy noted before, post-harvest water is, uh, well, agricultural water is any water that may contact uh, the edible portions of a crop. And ice, we are intentionally contacting the product with ice to try to reduce its respiration rate and maintain its quality as we deliver it to the consumer. The challenge with this is ice has to be made somewhere and it has to be stored somewhere. And so we wanna make sure we're we're, and, it and it's made from water. So we wanna make sure that we're testing the water that's used for, that, um, for making that ice. Again, as Betsy noted, it needs to come from a source that is not surface water. Um, and we need to test it in accordance with um, the uh, post-harvest ag requirements that Betsy highlighted. Um, the other thing, I, the other point I wanted to make here is I think it'd be really, it, it's really important to have dedicated handling tools. So, you know, sh if you use shovels for top icing or scoops, um, make sure that that's the only thing that they're used for and that they get cleaned and sanitized on a regular basis. The same with any ice making uh, machines. Um, they need to have a regular cleaning and sanitization um, protocol and our standard operating procedure. So those are things worth thinking about. I was re been really impressed uh, walking through certain uh, produce facilities where they have color coded um, tools, for example, and that's the picture there. All those yellow tools were just for one sp one part of the of the um, handling facility. And then other parts had different colored tools. So you always knew if you're using the right thing. And so that might be an idea worth, worth using. I want to talk about coolers a bit. I spend a lot of my time in coolers and thinking about how we can do things better here. Um, the first thing um, that the proto safety rule requires is that the, the grower confirms the function of the coolers and specifically confirms that coolers are 
keeping things at the desired temperature, which is lower than lower than ambient generally. Um, and so that usually is a thermostat that is actually controlling the the uh, compressor and evaporators of the refrigeration system. And we tend to rely on those thermostats and they're usually pretty darn good. But I always recommend having a calibrated thermometer as well. And I'm showing a picture there of one in particular that's not terribly expensive, $30. It's a, uh, ca and it can be field calibrated. So you put it in ice bath, you hit calibrate and you know that you're, you're reading the freezing point of water. Um, so good to check our thermostats with something that is known uh, to measure temperature well. The other thing that I want to point out about coolers is a significant concern in coolers is standing or pooling water. And that's that's true really anywhere in the process. Um, but let's talk about coolers in particular. Water comes off of the evaporators. And I know that that's counter to what we might think because they're supposed to be evaporating, but they're really evaporating refrigerant. And so when they do that, they condense water out of the air. And so that picture up top is showing that there is a drain line coming off of the bottom of those evaporators and the evaporators are what makes the air cool. And that drain line is, that's a great, that's a good best practice. That drain line is connected to the evaporator pan and it's run outside of the cooler. It's run outside. Um, and it's the, the point there is we don't want water coming off the evaporator and dripping onto produce or collecting on the ground, on the, on the floor of the cooler. So getting that routed somewhere intentionally is very important. Um, the other thing that, it can happen inside coolers, particularly with um, broccoli as a crop, because we do top ice or slurry, uh, or slurry ice the uh, cartons, is ice melt. And so uh, um, ice melt can, can occur while a uh, product is waiting to be distributed. And the, the, th the thing here is that water is going to end up on the, the floor of coolers. There's no doubt about it. And it's, the point is not to necessarily avoid that, because I don't think we can completely, but rather plan for it. So let's have designated travel pathways. This is a picture of a nice facility in Western New York that you know sh demonstrates that they have a very clearly designated pathway in between the pallet, sta the pallet stacks, which you need anyway. Um, but so any of the water being tracked from, in this case, a slurry uh, setup, is is be really being being contained just in that travel pathway, and that can be cleaned up pretty easily at the end of a shift. The other thing is including some drains intentionally in the cooler floor. So whether it's a trench drain or spot drains, someplace where um, a pitched floor, also another good practice, can actually drain uh, that ice melt um, or other liquid water to the, uh, to the drain and um, have it go someplace intentionally, not, not on other product. What we're really getting at here is water itself can be a source of cross-contamination, um, both from product to other product, but also because uh, from, from humans to product. And so we want to make sure we're, we're careful about how we handle that. The other point I want to make is that we do want to maintain high humidity uh, for most uh, fresh produce, including broccoli. And it's important to remember that humid is not the same as wet. Uh, humid air means it's got water vapor in the air. It doesn't mean that there's liquid water on the floor or on the or on the um, on the the uh, food contact surfaces. And then lastly, we want to make sure our coolers are are getting uh, regular cleaning and sanitizing, and that can be difficult to do, especially for a busy year-round operation. But making some time to intentionally clean out the cooler. Again, we're going to clean first with detergents uh, and water, and then also do a sanitation sanitization uh, step. The last uh, point I want to uh, mention as part of our produce safety overview is the idea of traceability. What we want to accomplish here is the we want to make sure we all have the ability to trace one forward and one backward. And for a grower, that means one step backward would be tracing back to the field where the product was grown, for example, so that we can identify uh, what biological soil amendments of animal origin might have been applied to that field, how it was irrigated, what, uh, what work crew harvested, the, the, um, harvested that specific lot or batch of product. And then one step forward, that is, who did we sell it to? Uh, uh, so that if we do identify a problem with a particular batch or lot of harvested uh, broccoli, we're able to trace down all of it that might have been a affected by the same factors. So it's really creating a system to be able to uh, isolate a problem and uh, mitigate the, the problem. It also 
has a lot of other benefits beyond just uh, produce safety and being able to do a recall if needed. Uh, it can help, you know, help improve record keeping and therefore improve quality of production. It can uh, also obviously has uh, financial um, tracking benefits so that we can keep track of sales and the uh, profitability of a specific enterprise or sub enterprise within a business. Um, and then the, the main reason for uh, that we're interested in today uh, is the ability to do a, um, a focused recall if needed. So that is the, uh, the extent of the produce safety rule, uh, FISMA produce safety rule overview and gaps overview. Um, does anybody have questions that they'd like to, Type into the chat box. We'll take a quick break for questions here. Um, and then we want to go over a little bit of some of the educational materials we're developing. So give everybody a second here to provide questions or comments in the chat box. Betsy, anything you wanted to add on my the section I presented? Um, yeah, I think you, you covered it, but the, the standing water, just to say it again, the standing water just is something that many people are focused on, uh, mostly because of the hysteria outbreaks. And um, so you talk about cross-contamination, but also the idea that this really loves those cold and wet environments. And so it's, it's tough to manage it in those environments where it can persist. Yeah, very stubborn. Um, and uh, we provide pretty good conditions because it tends to be the same conditions that our produce wants right. for high quality. Betsy, so we have a question. Is traceability required by both GAPS and FISMA? Um, traceability is not required in FISMA. They've said that there might be another rule that comes out that covers traceability, but it's not in the produce safety rule. Um, in terms of gaps, we recommend people think about a traceability program if they have to go through a third party audit. Some third party audits um, I would will require traceability or will ask a question about traceability. So uh, the word required you know, that's hard for me to specifically answer, but it's always good to understand where your product is going and to be able to trace it because there's a lot of good reasons. Food safety is one of them, but for most of our farms, the bang for the buck they get out of traceability is being able to follow quality, being able to identify how much a market takes of a product over a period of time. So there's a lot of good business reasons why to put traceability into place. Um, food safety also benefits, but um, so again, not required by FISMA, but a good thing to do in terms of good agricultural practices. So some of the materials that are the materials that we have planned uh, to develop as part of the um, Eastern Broccoli uh, SCRI project are the ones listed on, on this screen. Um, they include hazards, risks, and mitigations in packing houses. So the idea here is uh, providing a, uh, a summary of things that broccoli growers in particular might want to look at um, within their packing houses and uh, their post-harvest washing facilities or cooling uh, icing facilities that uh, are known risks or potential, um, are known hazards, potential risks, things to address specifically. So kind of a, a a quick uh, guide to things to think about. Surfaces and materials. Um, this is something uh, myself and my colleague Andy Chamberlain here at UVM have spent quite a bit of time in the past year or so on identifying surfaces and materials that um, can be used in, in particular in post-harvest facilities, packing houses, that improve the ability to clean and sanitize uh, those facilities. So um, we have a good start on that, but um, it's a constantly uh, it's a very dynamic uh, field. There are constantly new materials and services being offered um, by vendors and also um, new ideas coming in from uh, the industry, from growers themselves who are, who are identifying things that they're using um, or would like to use that we haven't thought of surfaces and materials. Drains is another area that Andy and I are working in actively identifying best practices for um, drains, different I, different types of drains as well as how to use them most effectively and also some of the uh, unintended consequences that drains can have. Um, it, for example, becomes another another thing that we do need to maintain and clean. Um, and there, there are some, there's some nuance to how to do drains well. So 
we're working on some resources related to, to those options and how to do it well, best practices. Um, these next two are sort of related, but uh, specific considerations related to new construction of a, a packing house, for example, as well as considerations when doing a renovation. We uh, spend a fair bit of time in both worlds, new construction and renovations, um, and uh, they obviously have their pros and cons, but we, we wanted to try to capture some of those uh, lessons learned and best practices in, in those two, with those two topics specific to broccoli uh, packing houses. This next one uh, follows on the, the conversation of cleaning and sanitizing, that's um, sanitizer and detergent options. So you'll notice that the rule, uh, produce safety rule in particular, and even uh, good agricultural practices uses words like appropriate or approved or labeled. And uh, sometimes it can be tricky for a grower who doesn't spend their time looking through chemical databases to find out what those are. And so our hope was to provide a, a fairly straightforward summary of what's available and what's appropriate. Cleaning guidance, so taking that cleaning, um, that single slide that we presented here today and expanding that a little bit with some specific focus on specific equipment and uh, that might be particularly relevant to uh, broccoli operations. The next topic would be training workers on cleaning and sanitation. Um, so not only identifying the best practices, but also trying to provide something that could be used uh, in a 10-minute uh, um, break room uh, training uh, that would really orient everybody to uh, everybody who has a role in cleaning and sanitation to the, the, the key principles and best practices. The next two are related to uh, pre-storage and pre-distribution cooling, so pre-cooling of broccoli. Um, I, had, I want to spend a little bit of time working on some materials for broccoli hydrocooling. Uh, it does seem to be a, um, a, an area with uh, increased interest, as well as broccoli icing, so best practices for uh, uh, icing, um, top icing or slurry icing. Um, Products. And I have a question here from one of the participants. I want to find out where to get these educational materials, please. It's a good question. Um, these are proposed to topics right now. They haven't yet been developed. Um, the, at the end of the day, they will be housed on the NECAF's uh, clearinghouse, and that is at um, go.uvm.edu slash NECAFs. And so we will make sure that these get posted there, um, and we can also uh, make sure to send a note out to the webinar participants once they're once they're completed. So these were the ideas we had. I, I would add, Chris, that we yep. also plan on doing a couple related to field production. Okay. So the good agricultural practices that we just briefly talked about earlier and trying to compress them specifically for produce production. Great. So, and Thomas Bjorkman is reminding me that um, the project outputs will also be posted at easternbroccoli.org, and that's in the chat box as well. So that's the, um, the project uh, site uh, for additional information on the project in general. Jill, are you able to unmute? Yes. And would you like to just provide a quick overview of the overall project that this ties into for folks, just so they're aware of the project? Sure. Um, the broccoli project is actually fairly big. It, it's packing a, a bunch of components. The first one is to breed broccoli cultivars that are adapted to eastern growing conditions that can put up with occasional heat spells and some of the other interesting weather we get here. Um, and we have both public broccoli breeders and big company partners working to develop those varieties. The next part would be to make those breeding programs sustainable so the breeders are incorporating new sources of genetic variation in their programs and uh, we have people working on understanding flavor which is another attribute that may eventually be able to be bred into broccoli better flavor um, there's already some pretty good flavor in there but there may be room for improvement um, we have a trial system where we trial the different hybrids that are being produced for this project. First, they're evaluated for overall quality, the quality of the broccoli crown. And once they have achieved a good quality, then they go into yield trials where they're evaluated in a production setting to determine what the maximum potential yield is. We also have a number of extension people working with us who are helping growers 
bring the best production practices in their area and they do support trials such as population trials to determine optimal spacing for broccoli. Um, they can give advice on rotations, what, where it might fit in in the rotation. And we have an economist working with us who is developing crop budgets and also studying the value of different attributes of broccoli to consumers. So do the Eastern varieties taste good to consumers or do they prefer things that are produced locally and far away? Addressing those questions. And we have a good food safety team making sure that the rest of us are keep, keeping an eye on, on practices that will prevent broccoli from the East from being the source of any future outbreak. So I think that probably about covers it. That's and great. Yeah. I just got to put a plug in again. The website easternbroccoli.org is the best place to go to find out about what's going on in the project. And it, it gets updated regularly. And we do put links to all publications on it. Great, thanks, Jill. Very much appreciate the project overview. It is a uh, it's a large project, mul multiple states involved, and uh, really uh, multidisciplinary and multiple topics that are really really exciting to see it all come together. Uh, Betsy, any parting thoughts? I'm guessing no. Great. Well, folks, thanks again. Our contact contact information for Betsy and myself are on this slide. Um, please. Sorry. That's okay. Any parting thoughts? I don't want to cut you yeah. off. My parting thoughts were thanks everybody, Chris, for working on it with me and Jill and Thomas, but also um, feel free to reach out to Chris and I if there's something that you think of afterwards, because we really are interested in input, certainly to influence what we do related to this project. Thank you. Sorry, Chris. That's okay. Thanks. Um, thanks again, everybody, for being engaged. Uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded. We'll um, post it for, um, for others to... Um, who you might know who weren't able to attend. Um, thanks again. Have a great day.